Coming up on Lawmakers, Governor Sonny Perdue takes the fight to fund peach care to Washington. Citizens speak out about the taxpayers' bill of rights. And the debate on payday lending takes on racial overtones. Those stories and more are coming up next. This is Lawmakers, your source for all the news from under the Gold Dome. Here are your anchors, and Wandy Lawson and David Zelsky. Good evening, everyone. Also on Lawmakers, parents of pre-kindergarten students in the Cobb County Public School System may need to find private programs in which to enroll their children. And the first bills by from GeorgiaSpeaks.com passed out of committee. But our lead story tonight, Governor Purdue goes to Washington. Governor Purdue was a panelist in a public hearing today held by the U.S. Senate Finance Committee in Washington, D.C. He made the trip to discuss the federal funding shortfall in many of the nation's state children's health insurance programs, or SCHIP. The governor was not only representing Georgia's Peach Care program, which covers over 270,000 Georgia children, he represented the programs in 15 other states. The following video clips are from an Internet feed, so please excuse the diminished quality. America is a compassionate nation, and we must continue to take care of our most vulnerable citizens. It's important to realize that the individual human impact of this program, remember, we're not just talking about numbers. We're talking about families and children. As we focus on new ways to reach the nation's uninsured children, I ask each of you, distinguished members of Congress, to preserve at a state's children health insurance program a, children, a program that's already meeting their needs. Utah Senator Orrin Hatch commended Governor Purdue on his explanation of the current situation and why Georgia and several other states are facing this predicament. Governor, I, uh, I really appreciated your testimony because you, you brought up the southern approach to this that I think is absolutely crucial to the working of this overall program. So I'm we're really pleased to have you here, and I thought you did a terrific job, and the rest of you as well. But I'd like to know why there is inconsistent data if, if you know, on, on uninsured children. And how can we improve uh, this? And, and there are others can answer as well. How can, it, how can we improve this data collection, especially since the state's CHIP funding allocations are based on the number of low-income children without health insurance and the number of low-income children in, in a state, in addition to the state variation in health care costs? One of the problems is the lag. Uh, the latest data was from uh, 2001 to 2003. In a growing state like Georgia, as I indicated, our enrolling population has increased 19% in two years. And uh, it doesn't keep up. There's a su significant lag uh, in that effort, and that hurts the population. The very fact that we are enrolling, so have already enrolled 70,000 more children than the formula says we have eligible is an indication that there's a serious flaw in the, in the funding formula. The other problem is once we enroll children, they come off of that 50% of uninsured, and it's a disincentive for being successful in this program. Georgia aggressively pursued the engagement of families through the Right from the Start program and have done a great job in that. We have a 10-year history of data now, Senator. We don't have to guess anymore. We can see where the trends are going. It is a mature program, and statistics will help us determine how these allocations should be appropriated between the states. Again, today's Senate meeting was just a public hearing, so no committee vote was taken. Georgia's current funding situation with this federal shortfall is only enough to cover peach care through March of this year. The governor ended his testimony today by saying time is of the essence. The Senate Finance Committee heard testimony regarding a possible taxpayer bill of rights in Georgia. The measure, commonly known as Tabor, would cap governor, uh, excuse me, cap government taxing and spending based on population and economic growth factors. Lawmakers Jesse Freeman has more. Jesse. In Wani, the Tabor measure exists now as Senate Resolution 20. It's a proposal that would cap government budgeting by amending the state's constitution. The Senate Finance Committee heard testimony from a few of the state's citizens today, as well as from lobbyists and a Washington, D.C based group called Americans for Prosperity. Tax and spending limits are needed to avoid the boom and bust cycles that state budgeting uh, experiences in which state budgeting in increases rapidly during the boom years and then there's a budget crisis when the economy fails and there's difficult decisions to be made. There's some fundamental flaws with that of, of what Georgia does and what state government does that natural growth is greater than population inflation. Here's one example. The population of Georgia over the last 15 years has grown about 40%. The prison population has grown 150%. So naturally, the corrections budget is going to grow bigger 
than normal population inflation would be. And under a tight Tabor, that would have to be made up someplace else. Tabor-like initiatives um, are likely to cut the muscle and not the fat, and that it is likely the taxpayers will feel the pain somewhere else. Um, whether it's a lack of essential quality public services or taxes increased at another local level. I would much prefer to see comprehensive tax reform take place before there are revenue caps. The committee took no action on NASR 20 today. Chairman Chip Rogers said at the beginning of the meeting that the resolution is subject to a good deal of change before it is voted on. The cap indicator could change. One thing that will not change is if it is to amend the state's constitution, it will need a two-thirds majority in both houses of the legislature and majority approval by the voters of Georgia. Reporting live, I'm Jesse Freeman for Lawmakers. Thanks, Jesse. One of the nation's oldest civil rights groups favors an effort to legalize payday loans in Georgia. The national spokesperson for the Congress of Racial Equality, CORE, was at the Capitol day today to drum up support for House Bill 163. There are constituents of the Congress of Racial Equality down in Georgia that are seeking, that need uh, quick cash uh, in emergency situations to deal with uh, sometimes a crisis uh, situation. And the great thing about HB 163 is it provides for a safe, regulated uh, legal means of people uh, getting those cash advances. Responding to a call from Insurance Commissioner John Oxendine for legislators to oppose this measure and to an HAC editorial against HB 163, the director of payday lending advocacy today wrote the Legislative Black Caucus to urge its support, writing, the editorial offers a rare insight into the elitist mindset of people in the non-black media and other positions of power who are enthroned happily in their ivory towers, hiding from America, safely situated well above us all. They believe that people unlike them are just po chillin who must be parented by those who know better than they do what's in their best interest. One of the things I take offense to is, is, is uh, when my customers and, and my employees or call things like servitudes or these people. This evening, Insurance Commissioner Oxendine responded, this issue isn't about race, it's about protecting Georgia consumers. As the bill currently stands, there's the potential for borrowers to be taken advantage of. We've expressed these concerns to the payday lobby and asked for them to be addressed. This is nothing more than a desperate attempt by the payday industry and their lobbyists to avoid giving much needed protections to consumers of all races. The Legislative Black Caucus does not currently endorse HB 163, but Caucus Chair Al Williams is a sponsor. He says payday lending is not a racial issue. I don't think it's a racial matter. It's an economic matter. And uh, I think that it's a matter that addresses a niche market where sometimes they're the lenders of last resort. You can't exactly walk in the Bank of America and say, I want $150. Is it? the best deal for money in the world? No, but the people who are borrowing ain't got the best credit, and, and, and sometimes you pay a little more juice for, for bad credit, but it does not gouge. House Bill 163 is currently being considered by two subcommittees of the House Banks and Banking Committee. Two bills from the website georgiaspeaks.com passed the Senate Judiciary Committee this afternoon. This website is a tool for any Georgian to share ideas and suggest laws for legislators to consider. Prior to the committee meeting, Senate Majority Leader Tommy Williams held a press conference to discuss a few bills that were initiated from Georgia Speaks, including Senate Bill 34 and Senate Bill actually 34, which came from a prison warden in Alamo, Georgia. It came to us from uh, a warden named Ralph Kemp. Ralph is with us today. And uh, Ralph, if you would tell us uh, how this came to your attention and what the, what the legislation does. For a long time, I've always felt like the victims were forgotten in a lot of cases. Uh, it bothered me a lot. When I ran across some pictures uh, that the inmate had in his possession, crime scene photographs and autopsy photographs, it bothered me even more. So I felt like that especially in cases where sex offenders, where they might have photographs of their victims, that this was just wrong. Senator Don Thomas sponsors Senate Bill 86, an idea from Georgia Speak which requires drivers of pickup trucks to wear seatbelts. Why, when we know it's the right thing to do, should we allow uh, children and adults to continue to be killed or severely injured? And especially, it's important now that I have clearance from Washington that we would uh, we'd qualify for the a little over $20 million uh, in federal funds. $20 million is $20 million. 
Immediately after the press conference, Senate President Pro Tem Eric Johnson presented Senate Bill 1 to the Judiciary Committee, which prohibits registered sex offenders from taking pictures of minors. Another idea from GeorgiaSpeaks.com. Citizens ought to take more, be more aggressive in bringing ideas for us. We know they do, and we know a lot of them come from them. Um, but I think a lot of the citizens think they come from special interests and are all generated by lobbyists. Maggie Garrett of the ACLU argued that this bill would be unconstitutional. So a 17-year-old who had sex with a 15-year-old is on the sex registry. For the rest of his life, he cannot take a picture of any of his children, any of his children's friends. He can't go to the prom and take a picture of his friends at the prom. Whatever court would be looking at it, they would say, this is, this is way beyond the scope of, of what you need to do to meet your goals. And so that's why I think that it's unconstitutional. After the committee unanimously passed Senate Bill 1, they heard from Georgia Bureau of Investigation Director Vernon Keenan and Senator Williams about Senate Bill 34. The inmates are asking for the photographs of the victims so that they, for some type of uh, sexual stimulation or other reasons. And I'm based that on the series of letters that we will receive from inmates as we, as we process their request as required to do by law. Again, the Senate Judiciary Committee passed Senate Bills 1 and 34, which both now go to Senate Rules. Senator Thomas's pickup truck seatbelt bill, SB 86, has not yet been heard in committee. The House today voted to rename the Dalton Youth Detention Center. Representative Tom Dixon told his colleagues that the man for whom it would be named is most deserving of the honor. The young people who are typically mandated to stay in these facilities mostly come from a home environment that doesn't provide a caring and nurturing uh, situation for the youth. At the Dalton facility, these young people have been exposed to adults from the community who volunteer their time to expose those children to just exactly that, a caring and nurturing environment. This is best exemplified by the service of Mr. Albert Shaw, who meets the, the description of the pastor this morning. He is a unique person with a unique passion who is fulfilling a unique purpose. Over a period of 31 years, he has donated over 12,000 hours of time in service at the Dalton Youth Detention Center. And the staff and the board of that facility have requested that we honor Mr. Shaw by renaming that facility the Albert Shaw Jr. Regional Youth Detention Center. House Resolution 21 passed 161 to 0. It moves to the Senate. In response to a state audit that errs in the budget for the Atlanta Lovejoy commuter rail, Representative Steve Davis today introduced legislation to discontinue the Georgia Rail Passenger Authority. I want to point out that this audit was not about the Lovejoy line. This audit was about commuter rail in general in Georgia. And I, I want to point out that it shows the dangers and the, the pitfalls that are around commuter rail. It shows that they spent $26.8 million studying this project and trying to find a way to make it work when it won't work. It shows the shortfalls of money that they have currently on the Lovejoy line. It shows the potential for ridership numbers being inaccurate. Currently, there is no staff members in the Georgia Rail Passenger Authority. No funding, no nothing. It's an empty shell. They haven't met since December of 2005. They've not been involved in any of the negotiations with Norfolk Southern or CSX. And I will present a bill today to eliminate the Georgia Rail Passenger Authority. The Clayton County Commission voted to withdraw support from the rail initiative after learning that it would have to come up with at least $4 million each year to operate the service. Clayton County wants the cost to be shared by surrounding counties. A Senate committee today passed a bill that supporters say is aimed at protecting your right to privacy. Senate Bill 5 would delay the implementation of the federal Real ID Act. Lanny Walker is standing by live at the Capitol with more. Lanny. In Mondi, in 2005, Congress passed the Real ID Act, which established standards for state driver's licenses and ID cards across the United States. However, the Department of Homeland Security has not yet defined the exact requirements. Senate Bill 5 would allow Governor Sonny Perdue to wait until these requirements are established before implementing the Real ID Act in Georgia. Senator Mitch Sebaugh, sponsor of the bill, explains. Senate Bill 5 seeks to address the, prim the, the primary privacy concerns. The bill gives, gr gives discretion to Governor Perdue to determine if adequate safeguards are met by the implementation <laughs> of Real ID. 
since the federal, federal government has delayed issuance of rules and regs by 15 months, and we're still counting. And implementation is only 15 months away. I'm not very confident that adequate, well thought out, well prepared, and well tested safeguards will be in place to protect Georgians' most vital personal data. Federal law supersedes state law in most cases. Committee members had questions about the bill's legality. Senator Sebaugh responded. We have a right to protect the, the identity of the very people we capture that information with. And so for us to turn that information over to anybody else, we have legal standing to, to, uh, to, to uh, take, a, to take action to ensure that that information is protected before we turn it over. So this is, this is the step that we can legally take in dealing with this while still complying with the spirit and the letter of the law. Senate Bill 5 received a due pass recommendation by substitute, and it now heads to the Senate Rules Committee. Reporting live, I'm Lanny Walker for Lawmakers. Thank you, Lanny. The Hispanic Chamber of Commerce responded today to a bill that would require all state and local government documents to be printed in English only. The chamber laid out their legislative agenda, which includes cutting taxes on energy to businesses at their annual breakfast this morning. Lawmakers Jesse Freeman has the story. Networking was on the menu at the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce's legislative breakfast. Members heard from legislators and chamber leaders regarding the group's goals. Georgia is, is one of 14 states that still has a tax on inventory. Uh, it's not very competitive for businesses. The Hispanic Chamber's legislative agenda is certainly not limited to one topic, but immigration law is an inescapable subject for the group. This morning's breakfast offered them the opportunity to speak out against legislation such as House Bill 21, offered by Representative Tim Bearden. That bill would require that all state and local documents be printed in the English language only. We come here to be part of this society. So that's an overkill, in my opinion, to say it has to be English only. We got a flood, basically an invasion coming on from our southern borders. You got people that's not willing to even learn English, and English is the one common thread that holds this country together ever since this country became America. This bill surfaces after last year's SB 529 ignited emotions over immigration issues in the state. Perhaps with the help of uh, the um, powers that be in this beautiful city and this beautiful state, will change the tone that was established, unfortunately last year. Freshman Representative Tony Sillier talked about his journey to this country and gave a heartfelt pledge to work with the group. If I can help you in any way, if I can further the cause, please let me know and I'll be there. HB 21 currently sits in the House Judiciary Committee. Reporting for lawmakers, I'm Jesse Freeman. Representative Tony Sillier is the newest member of the Latino Caucus and spent most of his childhood in Venezuela. Parents in Cobb County will be looking for a new place next fall to send their children for pre-K after the public school system announced this week it will no longer be offering the program as of next fall. Lawmaker Sander Parrish was in Cobb County today and has the story. The Cobb County school system blames capacity as the reason it will end its pre-K program after this school year. We have a fast-growing state and we have requirements, of course, for kindergarten reduced classes. So it is a, a space issue in many cases. There are some counties throughout our state where pre-K is not in the public school anyway, and that may be for space for whatever reason. And that's why it's so important we have multiple delivery systems so they can take up the space and the slack whenever these types of things may happen. Right from the start, Commissioner Marsha Moore says the department is working to help identify private schools that can pick up the slack. At Kitty Castle Montessori Learning Center in Smyrna, owner Rachel Cronkite is already prepared to handle some of those students. We are planning to have a satellite site not far from our center that would be able to accommodate up to five classes. She says while the building may look different, the programs are much the same as public schools. I think sometimes people have the perception that if you have all the bricks and mortar of the public school building, then the program is different from what it is in a private setting. And the pre-K program has the same requirements for a private pre-K as it has for a public pre-K. We go around, Felipe. Finding enough pre-K teachers may be a problem, though. Those in public schools make as much as $10,000 more than those in private ones and usually have better benefits. I think that will be a challenge, um, but 
Finding pre-K teachers has been a challenge in the past. Those are issues that have to be discussed and be talked about because it's true, teachers in the public school system get training and experience dollars through the system, through the, the law requires that and private providers do not have do not have that extra piece of that so these are things that you know we're always we'll be talking about and looking at commissioner moore will meet with comp county school officials tomorrow to discuss ways to accommodate the 500 or so students affected come next fall in smyrna i'm sandra parish for lawmakers presentation of a bill extending the right to carry weapons in cars drew concern from legislators in the House Rules Committee meeting this morning. Representative Jay Roberts wanted to know if the measure endangered police officers. The sponsor of House Bill 86, Tim Bearden, himself a law enforcement officer, said it would not. Neither the Sheriff's Association, GBI, nor the police chiefs spoke against this bill. <clears throat> As a law enforcement officer, I never had a problem with anyone that was carrying a weapon that was there for their self-defense and protection. Key as law-abiding citizen, if you have probable cause to search a vehicle and you find a firearm, you already have that PC there. I'm, I'm just concerned about law-abiding citizens that go through those kind of stops, how are we protecting them in this particular instance? You don't have to have a permit now to carry a firearm in your car, but there are some restrictions. It's got to be in plain view, that could be on your front seat, on your dash, or you even, can even have it concealed. And when they had it concealed, when I was doing road checks, they would say, officer, I have a firearm in my glove box where my insurance card is. I say, thank you for letting me know. Now, I would keep a very close eye on that to make sure it's an insurance card being given to me and not the point of a firearm. But right now, you have the right to carry that firearm. We're just clarifying the law and making it easier access for law-abiding citizens. And you think they're going to give my son that same kind of courtesy before they get to him? If your son's a law-abiding citizen, which I'm guessing he is, I'm sure they would. A housekeeping measure dominated the Senate Rules Committee today, Senate Bill 76, which restores a number of committee appointment powers to the lieutenant governor. It was attached to House Bill 98. That legislation changes the names of various House and Senate committees. House Bill 98 passed the House just yesterday. Senators said they merged SB 76 and HB 98 due to their similar housekeeping natures. The House Bill 98 substitute is now on the rules calendar for next week. The General Assembly will hold a special Saturday session, February 10th, to allow the public to witness legislative happenings. In response to criticism that he's restricting certain groups from protesting around the Capitol, House Speaker Glenn Richardson today invited the head of the Georgia State Patrol to explain why groups would not be allowed to congregate on the Capitol grounds. We're going to reserve that for the event for safety and security of everyone involved. If there are other events that come down to be set up, They'll be set up on the campus, but they'll be across the street on Washington Street, um, it, depending on the size of the group um, and, and how long they're there. We'll have a place for everyone to be. But the campus itself we're going to reserve for the family members and the families who come to, to enjoy the Capitol. Today was Community Health Center's day at the Capitol. Every year, the Georgia Association of Primary Health Care organizes an exhibition to raise awareness about their mission to provide affordable, quality health care to undeserved and uninsured Georgians. Lawmakers Candace Turner has the story. In the south wing of the Capitol today, organizers from the Georgia Association of Primary Health Care provided information regarding the various community health centers across the state. I think without bringing out the awareness of community health centers to our legislature, they didn't realize the need for us to expand into most of the counties or all of the counties of Georgia. Senator Greg Goggins and Representative Pat Gardner were also recognized for their continued support of this organization. And I applaud you for the work that you do in our communities, taking care of those who need health care the most. As you know, we have 1.7 million individuals uninsured in this state. Uh, we have 267,000 somewhat kids on peach care, about 1.3 million individuals on Medicaid. And we see that this is a continuing trend, and we need organizations and individuals in these areas that are going to take care of these individuals. After today, organizers hope that legislators have a better understanding of how community health centers operate and the benefits that they provide to the state when considering future health-related bills. Reporting for lawmakers, I'm Candace Turner. The state's forests were celebrated today, both for their environmental and financial contributions, present and future. If I had to give uh, a state of the forest uh, address today, 
I would say in the state of Georgia, there's 24 million acres of timberland that, that is available for commercial use and to, for you to look at and enjoy is in good health. Uh, we have an abundance of natural resources. We're blessed uh, in that regard. And when you look at uh, the trees as you ride down through the corridors and the byways and highways of Georgia, you can look, you're looking at clean air, clean water, and a tremendous impact on the economy of, of, of the uh, state of Georgia. And uh, I'm proud to be a part of this. As we get going into the budget process, remember that uh, forestry is still working on the same dollar uh, budget that they did about a decade ago. And I don't know if around your house, if you were working on the same budget you were 10 years ago, exactly to the penny, uh, how challenged you would be. If uh, forestry did not exist, you wouldn't be able to breathe very well. So uh, uh, we actually give you clean water and clean air. And I don't know how much of you have kept up lately also, uh, but we're going to be delivering fuel to you soon. So uh, you'll be able to have ethanol delivered to the pumps in your uh, neighborhood. Governor Sonny Perdue may have visited the U.S. Capitol today, but the, at the Georgia State Capitol, they had a visitor too. C-SPAN, the cable satellite public affairs network, made a stop on its Road to the White House tour and its campaign 2008 bus. C-SPAN is traveling across the country in this campaign 2008 bus, and we are spreading the news about our educational resources, and we're stopping at state capitals and middle schools and high schools and libraries. And we're talking with students and teachers to teach them how to watch our, our uh, network, how to use our website, and how to listen to us on the radio. We do go to the primaries and the caucuses and the conventions, so we'll be traveling all across the country. Well, we like to show students um, some video clips that pertain to events that are interesting to them in politics. And also, um, we show them our robotic cameras and our audio board and our lights. And they get a kick out of seeing how to control the ro robotic cameras. It's like a video game. The C-SPAN networks are available on many cable and satellite systems. Coming up tomorrow on Lawmakers, we'll have coverage of a basketball game that pitted state legislators against some special high school athletes. The legislators lost 31-2, to two, by the way. And it's the end of another legislative week under the Gold Dome. We'll take a look back and talk about the big issues with Tom Crawford of CapitalImpact.com. That's tomorrow night at 7 p.m. If you have missed any part of this Lawmakers broadcast, tune in tomorrow morning when Lawmakers repeats at 5.30 a.m. Now stay tuned for Ask This Old House. Tonight's episode features wall-to-wall -wall carpet and table saw safety as this old house is coming up next here on GPB. And that's our broadcast for this, the lucky 13th legislative day of the Georgia General Assembly. I'm in Wandy Lawson. And I'm David Zelsky. Have a great evening. of Georgia Public Broadcasting.